Uh, I'm wondering, did we come up with any rationale? And I'm going to preface the question by saying that obviously testing is something that is done in classrooms throughout the world. Um, it is of, it's, a, it's about as much a staple to teaching as teaching is. And so there obviously has to be some reason as to why we do it. Let me, if I can, get some feedback from the, from the audience as to uh, why, why we test. Anyone volunteer to get us started? Please. If done well, it could be a good evaluation of what the student's learning and what you're teaching. Okay, excellent. And I like the, I like the caveat, if done well, because one of the things that I think we need to think about, I give it as a separate workshop called effective, effective test design, is do we actually construct well, uh, proper tests? Right? Do our tests measure what we hope for them to measure? And do we tap into enough, let's say, of Bloom's taxonomy to really say that we've gotten beyond the lowest levels of basic knowledge? Right? If we want our students to be able to integrate and synthesize and perhaps even evaluate, right? are we giving them the tools in class to do that? And does the test demand that of them? These are all questions. And really, if I'm going to, just one second if you don't mind. Um, I'm, really, if a test is done at the beginning, you're all probably familiar with, um, in, 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 in the Yiddish Lashon, we would say, uh, we would say, Sof Masav Machshav Etchila. In the Hamona um, or amongst the world at large, maybe you'll quote Stephen Covey, you'll say, begin with the end in mind. With the, begin with the end in mind, right? Same basic idea. Right? What are my goals from the outset? What do I want to accomplish in this unit? And then my test should be a reflection of those goals. And I should really, from the very beginning, so where am I going to tap into these parts of the taxonomy? Where am I going to tap into these various modalities? How am I going to ensure that the student who likes to engage interpersonally, or perhaps is more intrapersonal, and likes to think more in solitude and kind of like bring the conversation inward, how am I going to give that child opportunity to really engage with the learning in the manner that is most appropriate and adaptable for him or for her? Okay, starting the unit that way, that makes your test creation a lot easier because it's all consistent with the plan. Too often, and I'm speaking for myself, not to say anybody else, but I believe too often many of us kind of think of the test, you know, three quarters of the way through the unit. We start, it's our first time teaching it. If we've taught it for five years, uh, we've, we've probably given that test a bunch of times. That might be a problem in and of itself for other reasons. But let's assume for the moment that the test was well done. It may not have been well done the first time around. And we sort of have to tweak it because we didn't necessarily go in with that vision. Yes? Um, for me, and I'm, I'm sure for most teachers, one of the main reasons for a test is forcing the students to review. Okay. And I think it's very interesting. Um, I'm a big proponent of review sheets, uh -huh. no matter at what age. Right. And I find it interesting when teachers say, and I'll see this with my kids as well, yeah. you know, well, I'm not giving a review sheet because then I'm spoon feeding them what they need to know for the test. Uh -huh. Well, uh -huh. if you want the students to do a focused review, right. and you want, let's say, them to be able to synthesize information and put sure. things in context, uh -huh. you want to give them focused questions. You want uh -huh. to say, think about the following things. Right. This is the question on the right. test. Right. You know, this is exactly what you have to study. Uh -huh. But here, here's here's a guide for review. Right. Think about these issues and questions, especially sure. as they get older. You know, why wouldn't you want to do that? Right. Because the review is, to me, the most important thing. Exactly. And that's actually something I talk about in my next workshop. But that idea of you're teaching to the test from the beginning, so to speak. But when I say that, I mean, to, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of training your students how to think. You're training them how to process. You're giving them the tools. You know, maybe we figured it out. We're obviously older. I don't know when we figured it out. I'm not even sure when I figured out certain things. But they're techniques you kind of pick up. Maybe a teacher gave you a nugget here. Maybe another teacher gave you a nugget over there. Most of us probably didn't, although maybe some did, have a focused student study, um, student skills course where you actually had somebody walk you through different aspects of how to be an effective student. We often take that for granted. And so we give them the information, but do we really give them the supports that they need? Excellent. Sort of a sidebar, not really the question, but an excellent point. I appreciate it. Yes. We discussed accountability throughout the learning process. Okay. That, that if students know there will be some sort of right assessment, uh -huh. then throughout the process they're more engaged in the That's learning. That's exactly right. accountability. I will tell you that as a mature learner in a PsyD program, that if I have a question for a discussion, 
I will read the readings that will answer the questions for that discussion and maybe not get to the readings that don't address that, even though the professor has provided us with five things to read, just because we become selective learners. Susan, it's good bit. I think accountability is very good because that's what drives you to actually do it. I agree with you. I was just giving you a case in point that even someone who's supposed to be mature and want to learn everything doesn't. That's what I was saying. Yes? Master. You want to get the students to master what they're learning. To achieve a level of mastery. Okay, excellent. Anything else? Please. Great. Great. Because we need to give, we need to put something down on that paper or into that system. Okay? It's an interesting concept. We could probably spend a lot of time having that conversation. I'm sure we'd have a lot to add to it. Yes? I know this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but yes. sometimes it's seeing how did I teach it. Okay. So for, for self feedback. Self feedback and reflection. Excellent. Thank you, Rabbi Adler. Anyone else? Yes. I love it. testing as yes. a way to uplift the uh -huh. person. Okay, great. The weak person. Ask a question. You know he can answer. Okay. So we build the students potentially if we do it correctly. If we do it correctly. And of course, the question then becomes well, what does the test look like? And is it the same test everybody else got? And am I just asking them? It's interesting, I, had, I just had this conversation last Sunday, I was doing a workshop, and we had a conversation about the difference between modification and differentiation. It didn't actually come out exactly like that, but if you think about it, the way we typically define modification is everybody gets the same content, and then I scale back for this child or that child who can't do everything that everybody else can do, but I'm not changing the core presentation. When you think about differentiation, it's got a lot of different aspects to it, including differentiating content, as well as process and product. And we're going to, hopefully, we have such a good conversation, we're trying to get there. Different, we're talking about today differentiation of process and product, right? How are, what are other ways that students can demonstrate learning besides for the conventional test? But thinking about differentiation, the nice thing about it is that it has a, does a better job of preserving the child's dignity because they're doing what they were assigned to do based on how they graded initially from your pre-assessment. So you give them a test at the beginning, you get a sense of what they ca you're capable of doing, and you push them really hard within their proverbial daladamas, you know, in order to make sure that they can advance in that, in that range. Whereas if I get a test, and normally the test says answer 10 out of 11, and you tell me answer four out of 11. So how does it make me feel? It's a question to think about. Is it really, well, yes, we're doing the child a service in the sense that we're giving them more options, clearly. We're giving them more opportunity to show something and giving them more value for what they can show. But are they, do they come away feeling like, hey, I'm really, I'm really capable, or hey, I really feel good about what I achieved? It's a question. I'm not saying yes or no. It's what to think about. Anything in the area of benefits? By the way, I do want to mention, I'll take your question just a second. The Ramban says, Ramban asked the obvious question, why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu test Avram if he knows the outcome? Why does he test any of us if he knows the outcome? If Hashem knows, I'm sorry? It's far as one answer, certainly. But the Ramban says because he wants us to see what we can do. He wants to take us me'akoach el Take the potential within each of us and actualize it. Make it real. Now, we're not HaKadosh Baruch Hu clearly. We certainly don't know. Although I would, I, would, I would challenge you that probably you could predict that if you've been with your ch children for a week, not a week, a month or so, they've taken a couple of tests in your class, in most cases you could probably predict within a 10 point range what they're gonna get on every test without even giving the test. Now maybe you still give the test because you want them to for force review whatever it is. But it's interesting. Do we really test to know what they know? It's what to think about. Okay. Um, benefits of testing, some of it we already talked about. For example, forced review would be a benefit. Trying to achieve mastery would be a benefit. Anything else? I'm sorry? All of them. That you have white tests. To evaluate student learning. Okay. Sometimes to build students. I think that works over here as well. Give yourself feedback. Those are all benefits. Excellent. Anything else? Yes? So figure out what you need to reteach. Okay. So. I'll put that in as self-feedback, that you now know I did a good job or I didn't do a good job, and now i got to go back. I don't know, and I, Mrs. Russo, thank you for raising that, because that's another little soapbox of mine. I don't know how many of us do that, and that's very sad. 
we'll go ahead, we'll teach two weeks on a particular unit, we'll give a test, we'll get the results back. How many of us really spend time looking at the test and using it as a, as a barometer anyway that will ultimately go back and deepen the learning that we've already provided? If you have, great, okay? Um, if you don't, it's what to think about also. Because what really is the purpose of this? If it's just to give a grade, okay. But if it's really to measure what, what they learned, and if they didn't learn it, that we have to go back and teach it, then we have to use the test in a different type of way also. Please. I'm not just sharing over here, but um, what I find so helpful is after, I have this policy um, that after a test that I'm reviewing, they yes. fill in all the correct answers, uh -huh. and they get plus five on their test. Plus five for doing what? For filling in all the wrong answers. If they for get, like, for under, filling in the test. Under 90, then uh -huh. they can correct uh -huh. the Giving them the opportunity to correct. Well, that's will. valuable. That alone is valuable. They always clap for answers. Good. Like, good, good. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Anything on the um, drawbacks of testing? Please. Well, if you give a test, it's one day in the life of that student. Uh -huh. And if that student is having a bad day, uh -huh. then you are giving an assessment and thinking right. this is what he knows when really it might not be. And you're catching them at that vulnerable moment, so to speak. Good. Please. Is there There's always students who are good testers and students who uh -huh. are bad testers. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm trying to think of how to do that. Um, I'll write testing capacity. And I'm going to include in that, even though I'm sure somebody would mention at some point, anxiety for some students as well. Um, some students just, the, the very fact that I'm taking a test stresses them out. And we all know that when we're stressed, we have a very hard time focusing on anything bigger than self-preservation, right? Whenever you feel like you're under the gun, your body automatically shifts. I mentioned Maslow a little bit earlier. Your body automatically shifts into self-preservation mode. Now, sometimes a student wants to save face, so they deliberately fail and they say, oh, I wasn't trying anyway, that kind of thing. You have that also. So there are a number of reasons why students would have difficult engagements, so to speak, with the testing. Anything else as a drawback? Please. Are those people studying just for the test and after they get all the information? Okay, so I'm going to write STM, which is short term memory, meaning to say we don't really hold on to it. Right? How often have you had that experience? You've taught content, right? you've given a test, the students seem to demonstrate mastery, you ask them about it a week later, a month later, whoosh, it's as if they've never learned it before. Have you had that experience? Yeah, yeah I've had it. So at least, at, least it's, at least I've had that experience. And I'm sure many of you, you also said yes. So catching them on the wrong day, right? do they have good <coughs> testing capacity, which is something I'll talk about in my next session. How do we help them be better test takers? Okay, issues of how deeply they've ingrained the content in their memory. Another thing that I'm going to be talking about later. What else? As a drawback of a test. I can think of one in particular that if you don't say, I'm going to mention. Yes, Rabbi Adler. It's just the boys that are, that, that are weak or they it just it knocks down their the self-esteem and everything else. Okay, so it's, maybe I'll just call it unfair, even though unfair is, depends on how you define that. I would argue that it's unfair not only because of, let's call it weakness, because weakness is a difficult term sometimes to define, it's also limited in terms of the modalities that it engages. Right. Right? A test is visual-verbal. <coughs> Visual-spatial with a focus on text, right? usually. And so if a student is a learner who does well by reading text, they'll have the best, the greatest advantage in taking a test. Right? Imagine, for example, that you're opening up a box of, uh, uh, you just bought a bookshelf at Target, and you're going to sell, oh, we don't shop at Target, at uh, Neiman Marcus, and uh, they don't sell bookshelves. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you bought a high-end bookshelf, but you have to self-assemble. Or maybe you bought your child a Hanukkah gift at FAO Schwartz. Okay? But it requires assembly. Although if you pay them $500, they'll come to your house and assemble it for you, I'm sure. But you decide to assemble it yourself. Now, they give you a little booklet, and it's got words, it's got some pictures, and if it's a really fancy one, FAO Schwartz, it may even have a DVD, you know, built into it. So which one will you use to build this toy? Depends on the person. Some of you would prefer to read the directions step by step. Some of you would prefer to look at the picture. Some of you may prefer to watch a DVD that describes it, right? Why not give your children the same advantage? In addition, it's unnatural in a way, a test is unnatural, because you didn't teach it this way. So it's sort of like you're extracting information in a manner that's different than the way that you taught it. It seems a little bit unfair. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that it's fully summative. Right? Think about the almighty value of a test. You've done two weeks worth of work. How much of those two weeks ride 
on this one day of testing, right? Forget the fact that the child may or may not have woken up on the correct side of the bed that morning, right? The test itself carries a tremendous proportion of the grade value in it. And so if I test well, I, you know, I've got it made. And if I don't test well, I'm really in trouble. And those are things all that we have to think about. Any other comments here before we move forward? Yes. If there's 20, 20 questions on the test, it's not going to cover everything that we said in the last week. Okay. Okay. So it's selected. Other stuff. Oh, here's the other one. Thank you. Here's the other one. We can talk about it later. It's, I'm responding to your question. And what if all the stuff that I studied is not, happens not to be, somebody earlier mentioned minutia, right? The little, the little details. You had mentioned that earlier. On that same point, if your minutia and my minutia don't align, Right? Aren't I cooked at that point? Because I spent all my night looking at the ten, uh, you know, uh, reasons as to why, uh, you know, General Lee did did or did not do X. And you're talking about, you know, Ulysses Grant in the in the in the essay, and I'm I, I'm just not I'm not there. Now, obviously, you want students to have a holistic approach to studying. You don't want them to only study certain things, but details are details, and we know we have a hard time holding on to details. Okay, please. Um, they can cause um, improper comparisons. What do you the, mean? The ki kids might compare their grades to each other uh -huh. and get a vision of this kid's smarter and this kid's dumber. Oh, yes. Or mm -hmm. it can cause us to unfairly label a child as uh -huh. a smarter kid or a right. weaker kid right. based on the test scores. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, what you're mentioning now is actually something that manifests in so many ways in life. Right? Think about all the people in your class who, when you were growing up, were the stars. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not stars today, but they probably don't sit and stand on that same pedestal that they once did. And they're probably people who were in your class were nondescript, or maybe were descript because of the wrong reasons, and all of a sudden they're stars. Now, stars in what way doesn't really matter. Because think about that school limits not only how you could demonstrate mastery, but it limits how we, you know, how we engage with the world around us. All of a sudden they step out of school. And they have so many more opportunities, so many more pathways, so many more levels of engagement, especially today with technology and all of that. So it's a whole different conversation in and of itself. But if you think about it on that level, are we really, where you tell people who you're smart, you're not smart. I think I'm smart, and there are times when I think I'm really not, right? I walk into a shirt clothing that's fully in Yiddish, I'm cooked. Right? I know a little bit more than I used to, but I still don't know very much. I don't feel very smart. And now I do a Shirkali in Chinese, now I'm really finished. Right? Same content. Right? It's not that I don't understand information, but it's the way you present it. Right? You present it in a way that I can't get it, I'm finished. So intelligence, so we're talking about multiple intelligences, intelligence is often defined in the way that we deliver it in school, which is auditory and visual. Those are the two main ways we deliver content in school. Now, everybody has those intelligences to a degree. It's not as if you're only one versus the other. But you're doing your child a disservice if you don't try to engage in multiple modalities. OK, so we did a lot of this already, which I think will allow me to move through this more quickly. This should align with your, you should be on the bottom of page one in the packet or the handout that was given to you. So well-designed tests connect with most of the learned material as well as the educational objectives we talked about Bloom's taxonomy earlier. Again, I'm, I underline these words well designed because that's not something to take for granted. Many tests are not well designed. And if you're not sure, you may want to ask a colleague. I would also advise you parenthetically, take the test yourself and figure how long it takes you to test. Uh, according to research, it takes students about four times as long as it takes you to take the same test. So if you've got a 40 minute block of time by which to give a test, and it takes you more than 10 minutes, you want to think about your test and figure out ways by which to either spread it out into multiple periods or reduce it in size, okay? Four students to review the material thoroughly, we talked about that. They serve as a baseline measurement. Again, yes, we could, we could, we could as we say in Yiddish, we could things it with this, we could challenge it, but Fundamentally, it makes sense that we have the standardized test, we have something that everybody's taking, I get a sense of who's really succeeding and who's not comparative to my test. All of this we've already written down, okay? The drawbacks, they're very much rooted in recall. Recall as in I actually have to pull it out of my brain, maybe recognition, but it's focused on information. And it really doesn't tap into other 
associated learning skills, right? I remember a professor, I was taking the, my uh, one final course that had started in New York out here in Roosevelt University in Schomburg. And the professor was right near Motorola Corporation. And the professor said he had a, some conversation with somebody over Motorola. And the person told him, you know, you people in education, you're doing it all wrong. I said, what do you mean? Well, you sit and you have your students work by themselves, emphasis on cheating, not allowing them to engage. In the corporate world, it's all about engagement. It's all about collaboration. It's all about communication. This was before the verbiage of 21st century learning. 21st century learning became um, popular. Okay, if you're familiar with the term, 21st century learning has to do with technology, but it has to do with a lot of collaboration and engagement. And I find it ironic that here we sit, basically in the first decade, or really the second decade of the 21st century, we've already defined you know, the entire century's worth of learning what it's going to look like. It's key if you're sitting there in 1914 and trying to define the 20th century. Okay, different issue. But the point is that there's much more of a focus, regardless of what a person does in their professional capacity, to be able to talk with others and to engage and to get that feedback, etc. Why don't we emphasize that more in our classroom? And why don't we have their demonstration of mastery also reflect that same thing? Right? When I do a project at work, and I give it in, I'm not taking a test, I'm providing a product. That's the, uh, that's the assessment. The boss wants to see the completion of whatever it might be. It's usually not gonna be uh, you know, a questionnaire. It's usually gonna be something you need to do. A report, you know, a summary, uh, an evaluation, right? So why not give our students the same tools in school that we're gonna be demanding of them when they go beyond school? Same idea, okay? They're reactive rather than creative. Meaning to say, I'm reacting, like we talked about before, to whatever the teacher asked me to share. Uh, the teacher may have had 10 macro ideas in this unit. I'm only gonna put down three essays because I don't want their arms to fall off. So I picked three. And what if they knew the other six or the other seven better than the three that I chose? Same idea. And I can only respond to the ones that you gave me. And like we mentioned before, they're disproportionately summative which means most of the assessment's happening on the back end, and I'm not necessarily evaluating or assessing as I go. Okay. 